Hey, photo world, welcome back to another episode here on TakingTalkPics.com. This is another episode from the former podcast. Please subscribe, hit that notification bell, and join the email list. Let's get to that 1,000 subscriber marker so that way I can add a new video every single week. Enjoy. Photo World Take and TalkPics.com. I'm Rob Kruger. This is episode 48, featuring photographer and artist Tom Phelan. Well, you know, and that's the thing. You'll you'll learn as time goes by what works best. I don't like seeing myself as a salesman. I mean, I, like I don't want to. I never want to feel like a used car salesman, or feel like I'm being perceived like one. So I try to be careful. <laughs> Today's featured guest is Tom Phelan. Tom, are you ready to rock today? Yep, I'm ready. Awesome. Tom is an artist using his photography to document the changing Midwestern landscape, although he does this in a way like I have never seen before. His subjects include dilapidated barns, rusted out cars, and a variety of objects associated with the rural life. Tom, welcome to Take and Talk Picks. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, I didn't even mention the fact that most of your stuff, if not all of it, uh, if I'm correct here, is done at night. Uh, and that's that's really the the big hook, not just the subject matter, but the time of when you capture them, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, it used to be that I would shoot occasionally during the day, but uh, now it's gotten to where I essentially only take pictures during the day if I want to document something that I would then probably go back and shoot at night. Yeah, that's that's really cool, and I think the work is definitely something that needs to be seen by Photo World out here. And I I just scratched the surface in introducing you and what you do and what your business is about. Can you take a minute and introduce yourself further to Photo World? Sure, right. Tom Phelan, and uh, right now I uh, work part time at the College of DuPage, and then uh, I uh, take my pictures at night, and then I do um, some of the fine art fairs in the Chicago area, selling my my pictures, and that's gone that's gone pretty well. It's not always easy, but uh, um, that's kind of where I'm at now. And then I continue to generate new images and look for new things to shoot as I go. Yeah, the the art fair thing, that's totally a different world that I've never attempted, but I've only heard how amazing it can be or how difficult it can be, and it seems like it kind of has extreme ends, and you don't always know what you're going to get, you know, until you you run through it a couple times, a couple years in a row or something. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. One of, the things, one of the things I did before I started doing the show is I spent a full year researching the shows, so I, you know, had a good sense of what I was getting into, um... And that, you know, part, part of that research was figuring out what kind of equipment to buy. And then some of it was just looking to see, you know, what kind of things would be likely to sell or trying to find out what kind of things would be likely to sell. Um, and uh, that really paid off in the long run because uh, if you don't take time to figure out, you know, what you're going to encounter, it can be very frustrating. A lot of people buy, for example, inexpensive equipment to start off the show. And then a thunderstorm hits either while they're there or overnight. And, you know, all the stuff is destroyed, things like that. Yeah. Um, there's just been, there's a lot to think through. So I found it I found it particularly helpful to just take my time with it, visit some art fairs, and uh, get a sense of kind of who was doing what, and, you know, as, as far as possible, see what was working for them. Yeah, and aside from that, it, it sets you up from seeing what's going to be the more most worthwhile way to go. Because when you're starting out with anything, I think most of us look for what's the least expensive way to do this, and like you said just a second ago, if you end up doing that, it could be a big mistake and be more expensive in the end. So doing that research for a year is probably a really good idea for something like this. And I think I didn't know that uh, for what you did, and that's that's really smart because a lot of people just yeah, jump in yeah. and think they're going to do great, and then all of a sudden they're like, "What the heck happened?" So yeah, and, and actually, the, what you just said is kind of a key point. It's, you know, it's people jumping right in and thinking it's going to work. I mean. You know, from year to year, the people who are at the art fairs, a lot of them are the same, but a lot of them do change. And uh, a lot of the a lot of the new people, um, not all of them, but a lot of them are you know somewhat older people who are either at retirement age or maybe near retirement, and they're they're looking for something to occupy their time. And so they'll they'll just kind of buy a tent and bring stuff out there. And it's you know it's just not quite that simple. I mean, you're you're dealing with a lot of very good artists. I right. mean, a lot of these people are doing incredible work in either photography or painting but sculpture all these different areas so it's it's just not quite so simple as you know throwing a tent up and you know here come the customers and they're gonna you know buy all your stuff <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, if it was, we'd all be a little bit happier, I think. It'd be life would be a little bit easier. But um, yeah, yeah. let's back it up a little bit. What what sparked your interest in photography enough to pick up a camera and actually pursue this as a career? Well, in the course of my life, I've done a couple different careers, and uh, at at one point, I made a transition and uh, decided to actually drive an over the road truck for a few years. Um, and what I found was that uh, that wasn't the most stimulating job. And so what? While I was driving, you know, all over the country, you know, keeping odd hours and things, there were two things I did to sort of entertain myself. One of them was in the books on tape, but the other was I bought a camera. Now, when you're driving over the road, um, oftentimes the only periods you have free are at the end of the day when you're done driving. So what, what actually happened was that uh, I would finish a day of driving, and it would often be, you know, dark outside, but I would have a lot of energy, and I'd want to do something. So I would go around, and I started taking pictures just with a point and shoot um, and uh, just just trying to find things that that were interesting and I've always been fascinated by <clears throat> old and abandoned things stuff like that so I, there's one night I can think of in particular where I got finished up my day at a rest area in uh, Iowa and I hopped to the back fence of the rest area and not too far past that I found an abandoned farm with a bunch of old vehicles and things like that and it was in the late fall and uh, I started taking some pictures. I didn't get anything great because, you know, with a point and shoot, you're going to be limited to 30 second, 30 second exposure. Right. Um, but at least it was a start. And uh, I found it kind of intriguing. And uh, so it was a way to keep myself busy, but a way that also, at least in some cases, allowed me to explore, which is something else I enjoy doing. Yeah. That's... And then, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go yeah, on. And then at some point, yeah, at some point when I had enough trucking, which didn't take all that long, <laughs> Um, I decided to, uh, you know, stop driving and then, you know, go back to college to page here and take some classes and then see see what would become of that. And uh, as it turned out, I continued doing the night stuff and then continued to refine what I was doing. Um, from there now, you know, I kind of know what I'm doing and the challenge sometimes is finding stuff to shoot, not how to shoot it so much. Yeah, it was just like it's a little side interest thing. Like, you know, it's eh, it's fun to take pictures. Let's see what we can do. And then you're using the only time you had, which happened to be at night. And I don't know many people that really focus in on, on shooting at night as their primary subject or time of day to do so. And mm -hmm. the few that do, it seems like it's only out of convenience for their schedule that that was the only time they had. And they discovered, oh, mm -hmm. my gosh, there's a whole possibility out there. There's a whole other world. And I think it's really awesome because it's – Looking at your work, it's stuff that I think most photographers would be like, oh my gosh, I want to go out and get a, a picture like that. I want to capture something like that because it's so interesting. Yeah, it is fun to do. It is, you know, part of the, one of what I see as being the barriers to entry sort of to doing night stuff is that it's hard to be up all night. Um, yeah. You know, especially when I do it consecutively for a period of time. And unless my body's already adjusted to being up all night, you know, it gets harder and harder as the, as the days go on now. You know, the period's never gone more than about two weeks, because that's the, that's the limit of useful moonlight. It's about a two-week period, the week before and after a full moon. Um, but uh, but it, is, it is fun, and it's very gratifying. So is there some sort of golden hour by moonlight that we need to know about? No, that's one of the... That's, it's interesting you ask that, because that's one of the neat things about shooting at night, is that whereas you've got that golden light at the beginning and end of the day, for me, the, the, whole, the whole night winds up being something akin to that. I mean, it's not always the same. It depends on the weather conditions and things like mm -hmm. that. But I, I think a lot of it has to do with um, the ability to have the stars in the background, kind of setting a broader context for whatever's being shot. Yeah. It's so different than what you're used to seeing during the day that even if, you know, it's not a very warm colored light, for example, like you'd have during the sunset, it's still different enough to be, to be interesting. And then actually, you know, when clouds and things come into the picture, uh, that can often add a lot to the picture as well. If it's completely overcast, then I don't even try to shoot. It's not there's not a whole lot that I've been able to do of the sort that I like when it's completely cloudy. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of opportunity out there. And then the other thing too is that because it's dark, that gives me the opportunity to control the lighting. Um, you know, whether using a flash or a spotlight, these are different things that I've tried over the years now. Um, there's just a lot more control you can have. You're not limited to, you know, a five hundredth of a second or a thousandth of a second at whatever aperture you care to use. Um, 
it know, it may it eight. may feel like more control to you, but I I bet a lot of people out there going out to attempt this for the first time wouldn't come close to the results you get. So I mean, you got to give yourself a little bit more credit than that, and uh, saying that it's easier to control because you know I I think there's there's something more uh, to your work than just you know using the the moonlight and you know you have that uh, longer shutter speed to play with the flash. You, you know what you're mm-hmm. doing. You know what you're looking for, and it's it's a it's a nice it's definitely an art. You know, it just pieces together. It's definitely an art. Um, and I feel yeah. like we're just, we're going on these tangents already and I love the conversation, but I want to get talking about your business and talk about the art fairs specifically. Um, you know, you did that research for like a year, just kind of figuring it out before you jumped into it. But since you started in the, in the years that you've been doing it, is there something you had to learn the hard way? Something that didn't go well, a failure moment, uh, concerning these art fairs that, oh my gosh, once that happened, you learned a lot and now you're better because of it. Yeah, a lot of it, there, 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 there hasn't really been any giant aha moments. I mean, it doesn't, for me at least, it doesn't work that way. It's more a continual process of refining what I do, um, both in terms of sales, but also in terms of presentation, even mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, what kind of, um, what kind of fine artwork I want to generate. You know, I mean, I always shoot things that I like it. There's never a doubt about that, but, um, you have to always pay attention to what Seems to work. You've got to find the right venues, and and actually, that's that's one of the people who do art We all joke about, you know, what is controlling what happens here. I mean, the show can be good one year, and then the next it's not so good, or you know, a show can be terrific for one person but not for another. Even if even if they have similar work, um, nobody knows the answers to these things, and uh, that can be that can be frustrating. Um, but you know, occasionally there are pleasant surprises too. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, is there is there something specific, like a story where, you know, you you attempted a you know a certain pricing bracket, or you you wanted to do frames and people didn't like the idea of frames, they wanted to do that on their own, or something something you decided on that that didn't seem to work out uh, totally, initially at least. Mm, yeah. I mean, there have always been, um, you know, sometimes sometimes I think is a great picture is either not what everybody else thinks is a great picture, or they may think it's a great picture, but they may not buy it. I mean, um, there's just, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of little things I've tried, you know, different frames, things like that, um, you know, whether to print on fine art paper and put things under glass, or whether to print on canvas, you know, floater frames, things like that. So, I never, I try never to invest too heavily in any one thing, you know, given that you don't know for sure if it's going to work. Yeah. Um, but on the whole, what I, the pattern I've settled into now is to have, um, you know, matted prints at a couple different sizes. It might be 8 by 10, 11 by 14, 16 by 20, and those sell well. And then I tend to have larger pieces uh, that are on canvas, and those those sell pretty well also, while also being easier for me to move around since they're on canvas. They don't have, you know, glass on them and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And that's actually a really smart strategy of just trying a few things, not invest too heavily in new new ideas and new attempts, but seeing what works, and then you can, you know, grow off of that or scale back from an idea because it it's not going where where you might have wanted it to. Um, but yeah, actually, one one thing comes to mind. I did try, uh, you know, Hobby Lobby has these barn wood frames that everybody said, oh, those are the great with your pictures, but you're off in barns, mm-hmm. you know. And I bought a bunch of those. I had a, a showing in a place uh, with those. But they never, they never sold. It was the kind of thing where it sounds good, you know, to have barn wood yeah. um, um, uh, with the pictures. But they just, it, yeah, people just don't, just don't buy that kind of thing. I think, I think they were just a little bit too unrefined in a way, even if they were barn wood. Yeah, no, that's interesting because uh, just from hearing about it, it sounds like it would be a perfect fit. And, yeah, that's, that's interesting that the consumer, the, the customers who are wanting to you know, purchase your work or going, eh, not with that on it, you know, like, uh, yeah. And they say they like it. I mean, that was the funny thing is you get, you know, I, I did people constantly come to my booth and say, Oh, I love that piece. But you know, the, the question is how do you get them to buy? Right. You know? Yeah. And, and that's the question for every industry, whether you're selling, uh, you know, individual images as art or selling your service as a photographer, you know, I mean, it, that's always the question. How do you get them to buy? And, right. you know, do you have a conversation with your, you know, people that walk by your booth, potential customers, uh, just some sort of conversation? Or you just catch them looking at something and try to strike up a conversation about it? 
I do different things. I mean, I try to always be someplace where they can see where I'm at and then hopefully realize that I'm the artist. Um, and it, it's it's funny because, uh, you know, you, you you think that people know who you are, but they, they don't always. Or, you know, they'll know you're with the booth, but they'll still say, well, did you take these pictures? Things like that. But, yeah, I'll look at, uh, I'll kind of watch people, and oftentimes what I'll do is, uh, let's say something is... Um, at least looking at a particular piece, I'll I'll just kind of step up and, and tell them a little bit about what they're looking at, um, either where it was taken or you know what it is they're looking at. Right. And that that that's a really easy way to kick things off. And then because a lot of the or actually almost all the shots are at night, um, people are oftentimes unsure of what they're looking at, and so it's it's actually very easy for me to engage people in conversation. Yeah, see, that, I think that's good because each of these images, yeah, it's a place that most of us have not been, uh, probably just about everybody who's walking by hasn't seen this in, in the living. And, you know, it's like, it's a good way to get it started because if they're looking at it and they're interested, you already have a place and, you know, a time and an experience of when you captured that and Mm -hmm. they can feel a little bit more connected to the work that way. And maybe that'll help drive the sales. I don't know. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's good when people have at least you know, an inkling of a question in their minds. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of work is very straightforward and, uh, you know, it may not elicit a question from somebody, but again, mine, because it's a little bit different than what they're used to seeing, more often than not, there is that question at least forming for them. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, can you, can you share with Photo World something that you think would lead to growth and success in a photography business, regardless of their current level, something that they can start doing today that's going to make improvements? Well, uh, for me, it's been, you know, just a lot of hard work. But I, the, way I, the way I sort of conceptualize at least what I do is a two-step process, which is, one, it's to, you know, create the initial images. And by that, I mean the actual, you know, raw file and the camera. Mm. And then the second step is knowing how to work with that image, which, you know, in my case would involve working with Adobe Camera Raw and then Photoshop. I think that some people know how to take a good picture, um, but then they may not be quite is good at working with that picture once they've got it. Right. And uh, so, and I just want to recommend is just learn your craft and learn how to do it well, both both sides of the shooting part and then I guess what we would call the post-processing part of it as well. Yeah, I'm always telling uh, students of mine, you know, oh, how do you get this? How do you get that? I'm like, just learn your gear. Start with that. Mm-hmm. You know, because they're, they're, I can't give an answer. Nobody can give an answer on how to get a specific image, you can give ideas, you can give helpful tips, you can give things that's worked for you, but the best mm-hmm. answer that you can give somebody that's going to help them on the next set of every picture that they take is, you know, knowing your gear. And I think it does start there, like you said, getting it getting it to a certain point in camera, and then for your two-step process of knowing what your camera gear is capable of and knowing what you're capable of after the fact and refining it to what you need it to be from from what you're envisioning. Yeah, and that's the thing is you want to, you almost want to, you know, there's some things we call overlearned skills, and that's what you want it to be because then you're not, like when I first started doing the night stuff, I was having to focus as much on how to get the pictures or how to set things up as I was on anything else. But eventually, the, you know, it becomes, I can focus on, you know, what I'm dealing with and how I want to frame it to get something as opposed to, the, you know, the actual steps that go into it. I don't, I don't know if I'm clear about that, but... You know, it's something overlearned. It's like writing. You don't think about how to write. You just write. Yeah. No, you know, I... It, free, it frees, up, frees you up to, to focus on other things. Yeah, I'm getting it. Like, you just get it to a point of being, uh, you know, instinctive to just know exactly. where you're supposed to go with this. And like just it's just when you walk into one of your scenes, you already go in and, hey, you know what? It's, it's this level of light from the moon. It's this clear of a night. I think I'm going to start with these settings and mm-hmm. I kind of know what I'm going to get, and and you shoot it, and sure enough, you get pretty darn close to what you were thinking, if not right on, you know, just because you've done it so much. You you know what you're looking at, you know exactly what you're going to get, because your gear is just an extension of you now, you know, it's another right. piece mm-hmm. of the puzzle. That, uh, that's, yeah, and that's particularly important if, <laughs> if you're dealing with conditions that are changing real fast. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I still go with that same kind of philosophy with wedding photography, it's just I got to know my settings when I'm walking into a room, not lift up my camera and try to figure out what my settings are because, you know, I got to ask my meter. Yep. You know, it's like, no, I got to have a good idea of where I'm going to start just in case I need to shoot right now. Um, sure. So, I mean, exactly. it's, just, it's just how it works. Uh, so, 
I'm, I'm wondering if you've got a good one for us, a good little story on an I made it moment. And it doesn't have to be a big, you know, a huge publication or anything. Just this, you know, simple feeling of validation where it's like, you know what? Hey, this is paying off. I'm doing it. I'm making it. Have you had a time like that where you felt that come to you? Yeah, like I, you know, like I mentioned, a lot, a lot of a lot of my feelings of like success and things have, have built gradually. But I do remember one moment where I was at a, I was at an art fair where it was one of the one of the top fairs in the country, and I had a a very big piece. In fact, I don't even print as big as this piece was generally because it's too hard to move around. But I remember you know somebody coming by and you know very little discussion or anything, just saying, I'll take that, you know, and it was, you know, a price, it was, it, was a, it was a good amount of money, but I remember, I, I remember thinking to myself, wow, you know, I created something that somebody wants enough to pay that amount for, you know, and to just snatch up off the wall and, and take it home, it was, a, it was a good feeling. And did you ask them where they hang out and who their friends are? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a chance to do that. <laughs> you got to get on their list, man, that's a... <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Uh, I mean, I think that's the the dream as artists, where we just get somebody who sees it, knows they want it, and they're not concerned with anything else other than how do I get that in my home? How do I get that? You know, how do I hire you as the photographer? I I see your work, and I just I know I need you as to be my photographer, or I need okay. that piece of work in my home. Like, I, I think that's the that's the dream. You know, that's I'd yeah, say that's even work. better than a publication. You know, because a magazine is uh, in it for something, you know, but an individual right. person they're it's only about them. They're, they're in it for themselves. It makes them feel good or happy or, you know, they enjoy the look of it, you know? So yeah. mm -hmm. I think there's something a little bit more personal there and that, that connection really improves it. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the nice things about the art fairs, by the way, is that um, it is an opportunity to get to talk to people. It's, you know, it's, it's something to have something in a gallery and you know, it's, you find out somebody bought it, but, to be able to interact with people uh, is really important. And, and also, you know, like you talked about, being able to tell a story. The stories are, are part of it oftentimes. Yeah. Yeah, right on. Um, and you do these art fairs. You are kind of plugged into that community, that network. There's other artists that you've worked with and talked to and been seeing at the same shows. During your photography yeah. career so far, what is the best advice you've ever received? Oh, gosh. Uh, I don't know that I've received that much. I've always kind of been out um, trying to figure out things on my own, I guess, is what it's come down to. Has anybody ever mentioned anything that it kind of, you heard it and it, it clicked for you and you're like, I'm going to try that and, and it worked out? Smaller things, you know, I mean, like, you know, different tips about presentation, things like that. But uh, Give me an example. Oh, just um, well, like with, with my with my booth. It was when I first uh, was doing this. I tended not to leave enough room in the front of my booth for people to easily mm -hmm. walk through, and that that creates kind of a closed up feeling for people. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think maybe you were looking for something a little bit broader. This is this is fairly kind. Of I'm no, I'm not. I'm I'm looking for these little tiny things because uh, in the long run. All these little things are the big changes that add up to, to making a business really shape into the model it needs to be. So I think this yeah. is good, you know? And it's it's always yeah. that little stuff, you know? Like somebody walks over and, hey, you know, Tom, why don't you just open this area up a little bit, give them three more feet to walk by? That'll introduce a, a space where people can feel invited rather than afraid of because they're claustrophobic about it, you know? So, I mean, it's just uh -huh. that little bit could have been a huge change whether or not you saw the effects of it instantly or not but it could have been a big changing piece uh, there's no way yeah, to tell no, actually, I'll, give, I'll give you an example rob of something that happened earlier this year um that, that's related to that and it's you know sometimes you can have unexpected effect uh effects of things so i was at a sh i did an indoor show this year and uh, at the show they decided to put me up on a, a little stage it was at a it was at a school and they had a little stage and they thought well you know if we put tom up on that stage you know, we'll kind of highlight his worth and stuff like that well, the, the actual effect of that was to create an invisible barrier <laughs> yeah. that people would not cross. There were like three little steps that you had to go up and then walk a few feet to get to me. And people would stand there at the edge of the steps, and they just wouldn't move, you know. And yeah. then you would say to them, well, feel free to come on up. And they'd get this almost look of relief on their face as <laughs> they'd come up. But it was, it, was, it was sort of a strange thing to observe. I mean, I'm immediately aware of it, too. 
Um, but you know, trying to help me like that, uh, it um, didn't work out so well. I mean, it was un- again unintended, but uh, yeah, I know. mean, the purpose of a stage is everybody's attention is there. But if there's a whole place is being taken over by you know competing things that are competing for our attention, everybody's walking by these booths and looking downward and you know straight forward there. Nobody's looking up. You know, nobody's gonna notice the stage area. It's just kind of blurred in the background. That's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> So it's like I, I get the it idea, but help. it's like, man, that that is a backfire for sure. It stinks. <laughs> but but good to know. So when that offer comes in the future, oh, we want to kind of highlight you. You'd be like, nah, <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, you can highlight me. Don't put me on, on the stage. Yeah, <laughs> I'm good on the floor with everybody else, <laughs> where the, all yeah. the people are. So awesome. Um, you know, if you had to start over, if you just had to take the same gear and the same knowledge that you have today, and and knowing what you know. You know, there's no business. You, you don't have any history, uh, no portfolio on your site, no website for for that fact. Uh, you know, what would you do first? What would you do to start it off again? Well, if I could start it over again, having none of my gear, but having the information I have now, I would um, I would go out and do what I do now, which is fairly targeted shooting. When I first started doing this. I, you know, I would go drive around and look for places to shoot during the day and then go back and shoot them at night. Now I tend to look for places, um, you know, using Google Earth and things like that and then go shoot them. Or, you know, I'll actually take a trip specifically to an area like North Dakota uh, and shoot that. Um, and so that's what I would change. I would have done a little less driving around randomly, you know, and been more been more targeted yeah. in what I do. And I think uh, the original approach... To it with the the name uh, all fits really well together. Share that with Photo World. What you call your project? What you call your art? Oh, shot in the dark. Shot in the dark. That's brilliant. That's how you started looking yeah. for this stuff. Just a shot in the dark, driving around looking for it. And <laughs> yeah, but, which, <laughs> that's exactly how it was. I mean, yeah. so, so you know, and there was there was enough stuff out there originally to to be able to shoot. In fact, I'm sure there's still a lot of stuff out there. I just um, it's it's more be- or a better use of my time to uh, to just uh, do things that way. In fact, one thing I've noticed, I, I recently, just a few days ago, I had to, uh, you know, do some more backing up of, of my photographs so that I don't lose them kind of thing. And uh, mm. as I was doing it, I, I looked and I could see the numbers of photographs I took each year. And it's it, it was interesting to see that starting in 2009, the number of photographs I've taken each year has gone down by roughly half. Wow. And it's not, you know, it's not, it's not that I'm not out shooting. It's just that I'm much more selective about what I shoot. Yeah. No, you know? I, that's. I think there's two different, two different directions that photographers go, and they refine their skills in a way that their business grows and they have to shoot a lot more, or they refine their skills in a way that they don't need to shoot as much. And uh-huh. it's it's kind of cool how those two play against each other because. They feel very opposite, but they both actually equal success, or at least the path mm-hmm. to it, um, or the same path on it. I don't know. It's 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 pretty cool and interesting to think about. Um, yeah, I'm hoping the trend levels off. I mean, otherwise, in about 15 years, I won't be shooting at all, but uh, <laughs> I think it will. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, uh, I can only do half a picture. This is just weird. <laughs> Mathematically, it's not working out anymore. i got to get a micro four-thirds camera just to make it make sense. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, so what when you're shooting you know what's one piece of gear that you cannot live without when you're shooting well there's there's actually two that i would put in a you know equally important maybe three the third being the camera yeah uh, one is a tripod you can imagine it would be impossible to hand, hand, hand hold, hold for during a, four or five minutes or however minutes. long you do these things yeah <laughs> yeah and then the other is uh the intervalometer um the intervalometer is just a fancy name for a, a trigger that holds the shutter open. Um, you know, I tell I tell people that I meet at the art fairs because a lot of times people are curious about the night stuff, and, and actually, a, a large number of them have tried doing at least a little bit of night stuff. But you're you're basically limited, um, even with a fancy camera, to around the thirty second exposure right. uh, without without an intervalometer. Um, and thirty seconds, just you know, that's not it's not light enough. I mean, it's not um, it's not enough time to get much unless maybe you're shooting downtown Chicago or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's it's annoying how the limitations of the camera still can get in the way. But uh, 
intervalometer, that's that is fancy. I don't know if I've ever heard it that way. I just always called it a cable release or you know something like that. Yeah, so. just yeah, just it, it's just a fancy name for the cable release. Is it uh, it's digital? Does it have? Yeah, it's digital. It has a little bit more to it where you can dial things in. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you can tell the camera that you can tell the camera to do like you know eight five minute exposures. You could tell you could tell the camera to you know take a picture in four hours and um, you know, wow. it is it is pretty neat. But what's nice about it is that with the intervalometer, I don't. I shoot, you know, since I shoot with more than one camera um, when I'm out, I don't have to be right next to the camera, you know, to end an exposure, you know, or to start the next one, that kind of thing. Right, right. Well, that's really cool. And sounds like a really important piece for your your gear and in your work. Um, yeah, couldn't couldn't do it without it. So. What kind of tripod do you use? Um, I think the tripods I have are Manfrotto. Yeah. Yeah, they're good. And there's nothing, there's nothing special about them, but they do have ball heads on them, which I've always found a little easier to work with. They are workhorses and super sturdy. That's what I use as a Manfrotto, and it's, uh, it's just solid. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, they've been good companions. Hey, there was one I accidentally ran over. Uh, it wasn't able to withstand <laughs> that, but otherwise they held up quite well. Hey, so, you know, just shy of a, a car going over it, they're pretty darn good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that should be I'm some sort of new car, model for them. I don't see your tripod. <laughs> <laughs> very nice well we're about to wrap it up here and you know it's just great that you're sharing all this stuff and we're going to have a lot of information about you and and links to your website and facebook page just so photo world can see the work we're we're looking at and talking about uh because it's so hard to see stuff on a podcast so you know let them let them get acquainted with your work and get a better feel for what you're doing but before we wrap up completely here can you please share with Photo World one parting piece of guidance and then the best way that we can get in touch with you to either follow along or just say hi? I guess my parting piece of guidance would be to uh, get out there and shoot when the conditions are unpleasant sometimes. You know, the best pictures don't tend to occur when uh, you're going to be most comfortable. Yeah. And then uh, to reach me, I'm at um, my email, thomasp335 at AOL.com. And then there's uh, Tom Phelan Photography. Um, dot Zenfolio. Dot com is my website, and then I'm also on Facebook and Fine Art America is another site. Very good, and we will have all that on the show notes page on TakingTalkPics. Dot com if they uh, missed it or need to get back and find it. So we'll have it in one place to find all those links and get connected with you and and see the work you're doing. Um, yeah, I really like the the guidance shooting and conditions that are somewhat unpleasant because it's the times when nobody else is out there. So you're probably going to see something that most other people don't see. So that's, that's awesome. Yep. Tom, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your time today and, and such great value. Photo world. Thanks you and happy shooting. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to appreciate it. Photo world. Our businesses can't grow unless we grow. Take the time and learn a little bit more about your Photoshop, Lightroom, and general photography skills. Kelby One is a great place to start. They have training courses, and today you can get $10 off your first course. Head to TakeAndTalkPics.com to the affiliates page, and we have Kelby One featured right there, where you can get your $10 off your first Kelby One course. Thank you for tuning in to another episode here on Take and Talk Picks. I will see you next time, and happy shooting.